Hello there, it's Mike with the Fish Tank Barn, and welcome back to another video. Uh, today we have a very special guest, Dr. Kevin Erickson, who is the president of MASNA and a biosecurity expert. We're going to cut this interview into two parts. Uh, today we're going to talk about biosecurity. Uh, so Kevin, if you could go ahead and give us a little bit of your origin story and uh, how it relates to biosecurity. Thank you very much, Mike. Well, I'm originally from Minnesota, but my time in the hobby started when I was in college in Florida. I went to the Florida Institute of Technology for uh, marine biology. And uh, during that time, uh, my friends were really into marine aquariums. Uh, so I started, I think, at the age of about 19 and uh, started with my first 20-gallon uh, long. And from there, joined the local uh, Marine Aquarium Society, which is the Brevard Area Reef Society, and just grew my, my passion, my hobby from then. Um, I kind of, at the end of college, like all, all kids do, say, what do I want to do with my life? You know, I have this degree in marine biology now, uh, and so I decided to do a one-year program uh, out in Oregon, which is the Aquarium Science Program. Some of you might have heard uh, of that program and seen other graduates around our industry, but uh, really learned uh, how to work kind of professionally in uh, large public aquariums uh, from that uh, opportunity. And from there, uh, moved into kind of a public and private uh, marine aquarium world. But during that time in that world and in those jobs, uh, I kind of realized that not even the curators or the, you know, the other employees or even the veterinarians at times didn't know how to prevent fish disease or animal from disease from coming into the facility and at times didn't even know how to treat it. You know, it was, it's still kind of a science where um, they have understandings of ratios or dose rates for cats and dogs and horses and chickens and sheep uh, and then they try to apply that to the aquatic world but to my interest mostly lied on how to prevent the disease from uh, occurring in the first place uh, and so at the time I was working uh, in California and I asked uh, the people in the kind of the marine aquarium disease prevention and uh, the aquatic vets I knew you know what what could you do where would you go to school if you could do it all over again for marine biosecurity and disease prevention uh, so they told me to uh, go to a certain place uh, in Scotland for my master's degree. Fortunately, I was able to get in there. And from there, I focused kind of on the diagnostics, the pathology uh, and parasitology aspects uh, of aquatic uh, diseases and prevention. Uh, and then from uh, there, after the time, my time in Scotland, er earning my master's, uh, kind of focused more back onto the marine aquarium industry itself. Uh, I understood and saw, you know, in, uh, in my time attending MACNA, uh, from 2010 until now, and my time as a hobbyist from back from when I was 19 until now, that uh, we need I needed to focus on the disease prevention in the marine aquarium industry. Uh, so fortunately, with uh, with help of my uh, PhD advisor, I was able to uh, write a grant and a project that looks uh, looked at in past tense now uh, the disease prevention uh, on an entire uh, nation national scale. And so that na nation was the country of Australia. Some of you who have met me um, over the past years knew that uh, when I attend MACNA, I do fly across the world to go over to MACNA. Uh, but the, my PhD brought me to Australia, where I was uh, able to uh, study uh, kind of Australia's national biosecurity program and the steps that Australia takes to prevent disease from coming into their country. Uh, but then, you know, like all systems, and no matter how much you try, uh, the system and the prevention is a, a leaky system. And, and so I, I monitored and measured uh, how that disease made it into the country through Australia's national biosecurity program and, uh, and quarantine program. And then I then watched and monitored how that disease and those organisms that were imported came through the importers, through the wholesalers, into the store level, and into the hobbyists. I asked all of those people and all those interest groups throughout that entire value chain. I asked them their behaviors. I asked them a series of about 50 questions. And I asked them, what do they do when their fish are sick? What do they do when the fish are healthy? Would you tell someone else uh, if your fish was sick, if they wanted to buy or they wanted to take that fish from you? Those kind of questions. And from there, I was able to analyze the entire trade network based on both the fish disease and health and based on the human aspect and the human behavior aspects, bringing that all together and doing a, a risk analysis of, of uh, an entire entire. Uh, value chain of marine aquarium hobbyists and, and the entire industry. But from there, kind of mixing the aspects of biosecurity, disease prevention, people's behavior, and the entire system and the global marine aquarium trade all together. So that's kind of my origin story pertaining to marine aquariums and, and biosecurity. Right. Thanks, Kevin, for giving us your origin story. I uh, really appreciate that. 
Now let's cover the piece of biosecurity that we're all pretty much familiar with, the quarantine system. Can you tell us your recommendations for a quarantine system? So one thing that we want to make sure that everyone does is has a quarantine system. Now, quarantine to different people means different things as well. Uh, but we want to make sure as marine aquarium uh, hobbyists and if you are a store owner, uh, you're doing the same thing, is that you're bringing in a new batch of organisms, whether they're coral or other invertebrates or fish, and you're putting those uh, organisms through a 30-day quarantine period every single day, if not more frequent. You're checking for signs of disease, parasites, uh, conditions, and then uh, doing that consecutively for 30 days allows the different parasites or diseases uh, that have different life cycles to present themselves. Uh, oftentimes, you'll see people say seven days, you'll see people say 14 days. Uh, I would do it for 30 days, and this is under the assumption that it's uh, at room temperature as well. Uh, for that subgroup of people who have the temperate marine aquarium uh, tanks and they also have quarantine, I would do it for even longer, looking at 60 or 90 days, um, because that reduced temperature uh, prolongs the life cycle of, of a lot of those uh, parasites that uh, might be infecting uh, your fish or invertebrates. But making sure that you put everything in at the same time and that everything comes out at the same time. It's a lot of work to do quarantine. Uh, you know, I, I travel all around and I see people who have not spent thousands of dollars, but have spent tens of thousands of dollars on their fish room, uh, on their main display, uh, on in these coral grow out tanks or these uh, ornamental aquaculture uh, systems. And we want to make sure that we're protecting those. and. Quarantine acts as a barrier for that disease uh, from entering into your main display, potentially where you have your tens of thousands of dollars of livestock. So I think, Mike, in your system, for example, uh, in your in your fish room there, you have uh, not only a like a normal kind of everything marine setup, but you also have a separate setup uh, for your aquaculture for your larval clownfish. Is that right? Right. Yeah. So hopefully. Uh, either on either of those systems you have, or for both systems rather, you have different hardware. You have different nets, you have different plumbing, you have different pipes, you have different siphons. You know, you're keeping everything labeled, keeping them in its own section in different parts of the physical room. And hopefully, you know, given the temperature in Michigan right now, it may not be too much of a concern, but you're sterilizing those in between each use as well. Uh, so when you're at a scientific uh, lab, uh, dealing with ornamental aquaculture or ornamental fish, whether you're in a public facility at a public aquarium, uh, after every use of every tube, every uh, you know ladle, every scoop, every net use, you're actually sanitizing uh, that instrument, uh, and then you're removing the sanitization chemical, whether it's bleach or um, something else, depending upon where you live, uh, and then you're letting that to dry. Now. It's difficult, you know, if you are your own person in your house, in your own aquarium, and you only have one set of tools, I would say at least please go get your own net. And everyone has more than one bucket laying around. If you don't, please go get more buckets for emergency sakes anyways. I'll but, go, buy, just go buy some more salt. Go buy, <laughs> go buy some more salt, is that what you said? Yeah. Yeah, go buy some more salt because that comes in buckets. That's right. So, uh, yeah, everyone has buckets. And once they're, you know, never, never put the buckets together because then they're impossible. Uh, from getting apart, but that's that's a different story. Uh, but also label your different tools, uh, whether it's a piece of tape or you're spray painting them uh, pink and green and purple or whatever to make sure that you're telling them apart. Uh, but you're sanitizing those tools uh, in between each use. Um, now, if you're your own person and you have a huge fish room like Mike, uh, you know, you're going in there and you're saying to yourself, what is the most susceptible organisms I have to disease? Uh, and then what might have a disease already? And you need to prioritize your interaction with those animals, not only to make sure that you're uh, caring for them, but that you're not going to transfer disease from one tank to another. Uh, so if you have super sensitive organisms uh, that require special care or very uh, defined water quality, you might want to consider interacting with those organisms first and then sanitizing not only your tools, but your hands. And that Thanks, Kevin, for enlightening us on uh, quarantining our fish. Um, if you could just let us know a little bit about some of the tools we can use um, as aquarist uh, to uh, help with pathogens and disease prevention. Historically, um, in the marine aquarium industry and the hobbyist community, I think it's safe to say we saw more ozone use initially, um, but available to hobbyists, small UV and small ozone systems. Now, if you don't feel comfortable with uh, ozone and you don't have an ozone safe skimmer, for example, or plumbing, uh, you can always plumb in line uh, or in a, in a separate closed loop, a UV light. 
Um, there are plenty of UV lights available on the market for hobbyists in various sizes. They even go down to uh, from 6 watts, I think, up to 80 or 100 watts. It's a bit high on the high end. Um, but those are available uh, to hobbyists, and they run passively in the background. Um, there are some great websites, great forums that have online calculators where you can uh, figure out not only what size and what wattage of UVC filter you need, but uh, need to run that UV filter 24 hours a day. Bulb life on a UV filter is usually around 18 months of continuous use, and then you're looking at replacing the bulb. Uh, there is some uh, ongoing maintenance as well. You want to make sure that the, the quartz sleeve is clean, for example. Um, but you want to make sure that uh, you do that calculation and find those calculators online so that you're getting the right uh, zap dose, as, <laughs> as you'll see it called. Um, you're, you're applying the correct amount of UV rays uh, to the organisms that are flowing through the water over a certain amount of time. Uh, and so by slowing down the, the water flow through the UV filter or by buying a, a higher wattage UV filter, you can increase that uh, zap time. You can increase the amount of time that the, that water is exposed to the UV radiation. And ultimately, by increasing that, uh, you can kill <laughs> uh, the organisms that uh, are harmful in the, in the water as they pass through that UV filter. Um, you know, Mike, you have a semi-sealed environment there uh, in your room. And, uh, you know, ozone probably isn't the best case for you because uh, unless you're filtering that uh, ozone out to the outside through a skimmer outflow or some other means, you know, UV is probably a good option for you, but you have uh, several systems. So, you know, the first thing that's always the cheapest is to look at your procedures. Um, figure out, you know, do you have an extra $2 to go buy a net that will allow you to go ahead and use separate nets, separate tubes, uh, separate siphons on different tanks? Um, and so you're not transferring the water, transferring the disease between different systems. And for the um, UV sterilizer, uh, does it actually help um, kill beneficial things as well, like beneficial bacteria or any other, or is it negligible to the point where you should just run it and it doesn't matter? No, as a scientist, I don't have the numbers to show you either way. Uh, as a hobbyist, you know, we know that the nitrifying bacteria live on every surface. Um, the same is true of uh, potential pathogens, viruses, bacteria, um, but they're flowing through the water as well. Uh, and so our opportunity to expose the surfaces of our tank to UV light uh, is available, but it's harmful to you and I and to the fish. Uh, anything usually with eyeballs uh, can't take too much UV light. Uh, so our opportunity to uh, blast the, the pathogens uh, where they where they are is limited to basically in the water column. Uh, but we, for the most part, at least in the marine space, uh, have the ability to uh, to target that water as it moves from a sump to a display or a display to a refugium or within a sump. Um, you know, in the freshwater community, I think a lot of your viewers are freshwater people, uh, you can run a closed loop uh, and you actually have more fine control uh, over the flow of that closed loop um, and making sure you dial it in. So you can have uh, a hang on tank. This is a, a prop I'm gonna show to the camera here, totally not for its purpose, but we're all familiar with like the, the hang on tank loops that, came, that come back from a return pump. And you can do the same thing with something similar. You can hang on the side of your tank. Uh, you can like pl plumb your uh, return line into the bottom and you can have it pass through an eight watt UV filter. And so they're really easy to implement. You don't need to like disassemble a bunch of hard plumbing and plumb something in uh, horizontally. There are vertical uh, UV filters uh, out there on the market and you can uh, plumb those in line very easily. Now, eight watts may be enough for you, your volume, your system, um, and there are larger ones available, but I, I know of a product out there in the market that is quite easy to implement. Um, and at eight watts, really, it's, uh, <laughs> it's not that much extra electricity in the scheme of our lights, our pumps, uh, although it's less true now with LEDs and, and DC pumps, but uh, for the added protection, uh, it's there. So uh, definitely go look up those calculators online, uh, find uh, the wattage uh, and the, the rated f flow rate for the model you might be interested in or the model that your local fish store has available um, and uh, do your research, making sure that uh, diseases that you've had in the past or diseases that the store might actually have if, they'll, if they're willing to tell you or uh, diseases that your, uh, your friends or your club, uh, fellow club members have had in their tanks 
uh, are treated by the, the the wattage and by the flow rate that the model that you're interested in buying uh, can can uh, zap or can prevent. So, uh, yeah. So, Kevin, I got a question for you about the um, hobbyists themselves. Is there a disease uh, or a bacteria or a parasite that the hobbyists themselves could get uh, from the fish that come in from the trade? Yeah, that's a good question. So, and this is true of the freshwater and uh, marine industries. Um, and so I'm more familiar with the, the saltwater ones, um, but they're called zoonotic diseases. And uh, zoonotic diseases are uh, diseases that can pass between uh, different species. Um, and so they might be uh, infecting one species, but also might be a carrier on another. For example, you know, if you live with cats and dogs, you actually might be a, a, the way in which your cat and dog get sick. Um, it's, it's, it's tough to say this, it's sad to say this, but if you go visit a, a pound or if you go visit uh, even a friend who has a cat or a dog, you might be the way in which a flea makes it into your house. You might be the way in which uh, a virus makes it from their animal to your animal. This is true of uh, fish diseases as well. You can go to your, your friend's store, uh, or you can go to your friend's aquarium uh, in their house and you can get your hand wet or you can bring a plastic bag and you could be having that disease on you. Now, typically, that disease isn't going to affect you. That disease is just going to be passively on you or in you. Um, a life stage of that disease might be on you or in you. Uh, but there are times where that uh, disease can also in affect you uh, and infect you. Um, so those are called zoonotic diseases. And I, I realize the lack of uh, literature available to the common hobbyist uh, on that topic a couple of years ago. And so myself and one of my old classmates, uh, Dr. Harper, uh, we wrote a, uh, a hobbyist focused uh, article about that. And it's available on Mazna's website for free. Um, you can go to mazna.org. Uh, I think you go under Mazna Education and you click down to zoonotic diseases. And you can read about um, and look at the, the diseases that are uh, unfortunately zoonotic in, in, and are common in the marine aquarium industry. Um, so if you were at all skittish, um, if you don't like pictures of people with open sores, um, you may not want to watch or may not want to read that. Um, but for your own safety, please go and read that. At least you can look away, scroll down to the bottom, and look for the list of things that you can do as a, an Aquarius to help protect yourself. Now, it's a bit silly, but we all understand that we should be wearing sunscreen now, right? 30, 40 years ago, that wasn't a thing. When we are elbow deep, shoulder deep uh, in our marine aquariums, we oftentimes will have open cuts or sores on our fingers, on our hands. And that's a, a way in which those diseases can uh, get into a, our, our body. And uh, so they do sell, and I would recommend for the, for the prevention of zoonotic diseases, at least in yourself, you can wear wrist gloves. They even have shoulder gloves. Um, we mentioned siphoning earlier. Please do not mouth siphon. That is starting the siphon with your mouth by sucking in the air in the tube. Um, you might ingest some of that water. And that water, if your tube is in the sediment, in the gravel of your marine or freshwater aquarium, might end up in your mouth, um, especially if, uh, if your fish are sick. So what you can do, you know, and, and I'm not sure if this is practiced too much, uh, and it's, this, is a, this is a safe procedure in low, in low volumes because you're not going to be altering the salinity of your tank too much, is uh, take your sterilized uh, siphon tube from the last time you cleaned it that's already dry, right, and uh, fill it full of RO water or newly mixed salt water or tank water, and then plug both ends, put one end in, you know how to do the dance, making sure that you don't end up spilling water on yourself, uh, and then letting go and allowing that siphon to occur without having to mouth siphon. But I think we have like seven or eight uh, different um, uh, guidelines or pieces of advice uh, for uh, Aquarius in general uh, on the article. So you can go to masna.org, that's the Marine Aquarium Societies in North America, uh, and then click on Masna Education and go to uh, Zoonotic Diseases. Uh, there's also uh, some, some preventative techniques. We talk slightly about biosecurity there. But it's also basically a tool, not only for the hobbyists, but we've been contacted, strangely enough, by medical professionals in the Upper East Coast of the United States, uh, thanking us th uh, for this article as a resource. 
uh, because, you know, Mike, you're in Michigan. Uh, I grew up in Minnesota. If we go to our general practitioner and we show them an open sore or these weird red bumps on our hands, you know, they're going to pass it off as some skin irritation that's probably a safe bet for them to do because it's a common, you know, uh, a common way for a, a rash to, to present itself. Um, and so that might be myco of some site of some, some type rather. Um, and that, or that might be something else. So definitely go, go have a look at that resource. Um, that resource along with a bunch of other uh, MAS and education articles uh, pertaining to uh, other, uh, other things like lionfish and re fish release and invasion and other aspects that MAS that thinks are important are available also um, at MAS.org. Um, and both those other articles and this article not only are available as uh, a website, but are as available as a printable PDF. We had uh, someone who was good at laying out articles and go ahead and put that into a, a format that allows you as a hobbyist or you as a club representative to print out and pass on to uh, your club. If you see MASNA uh, or MACNA at a show near you, and especially at MACNA, uh, we have these educational articles printed out as a booklet and we can send these to you uh, and to your club so you can help spread that information. But yeah, marine zoonotic diseases are something that Typically, you might see on a, a public aquarium hobbyist, or excuse, a public aquarium employee's arms or hands or fingers, uh, or else they might actually uh, be on a, a store owner's hands uh, or fingers as well. Some of these photos, I think, for, are from a store owner's hands. Um, it's it's unfortunate, but um, yeah. What, do you have any other questions about uh, zoonotics? Um, is there any? Do you know of any freshwater? I know that's not your area of expertise. Um, are there any freshwater zoonotic diseases that you know that you should think of, or is it more of um, is that really not in your wheelhouse? They, you know, that's not really in my wheelhouse. I, I know uh, in my wheelhouse rather, I know that they do exist. Um, you know, with lakes and rivers and streams, um, there are always other things that may not uh, infect us but can make us sick. Uh, cyanobacteria, for example, you might have heard it called uh, blue-green algae, um, can be present, uh, especially uh, in the warm summer months um, across almost every temperate and tropical area. Um, and that can be quite deadly to not only humans, but to dogs. You might bring your dog to the lake, uh, have your dog on your boat, uh, have it jump off. Um, you and I even in swimming pools, like we get water in our mouth. And so that is a, it is a, a way in which those uh, diseases can be, uh, can gain entry into our body. Um, you know, typically a hobbyist, uh, whether they're fresh or salt, uh, unless they're quite uh, well off, isn't snorkeling in their marine aquarium. Uh, but we have our, our hands in there and we have our arms in there and we have bristle worms in there. We have sharp rocks in there. Uh, so that's the way in which we can, uh, we can have those diseases enter our body. No matter if you're fresh or salt, wear, wear your PPE. Um, wash your hands, not only before you go into the tank, but after you go into the tank as well, and between tanks, because you don't want to be transferring uh, those diseases, whether you're susceptible or not, to uh, your other tanks. Now, for example, say I, I do something, like I work on my saltwater tank, and I go, stick my hand in my freshwater tank. Would I transfer diseases between the two? Uh, if you're from Florida or Maryland, uh, North Carolina, uh, mostly the East Coast of the United States, they have environments along the coast uh, where freshwater rivers, streams, lakes, water bodies uh, meet the ocean. And so there are whole communities of organisms that live in water, which is called brackish water. Uh, these environments have salinities ranging from you know, two or three parts per thousand or PSU, um, all the way up to full salinity. But those organisms, uh, whether they're in the intertidal area, that's the area that is affected by the ocean tides or potentially by the increased river runoff due to rain, uh, those organisms that live there and the, the diseases, the viruses, the bacteria, uh, they can survive in a uh, large uh, range of salinities. And so in, it, there might be an opportunity for, for diseases to go in there. You know, as I see the hobby expand and grow into various aspects, you see terrariums now. Uh, you see these uh, you stores offering 
uh, no, not only reptiles, but amphibians. Um, we have uh, people who have kind of terrestrial and marine systems all in one tank with you know a sandy area that are bringing in mangroves potentially from the wild. Uh, and so there's an opportunity for diseases like never before uh, to cross uh, into our homes from the wild. And so definitely making sure that you're always preventing a disease not only from coming into your system, but into yourself as well. All right, Kevin, uh, what are some things you can do to protect yourself uh, when you're purchasing fish from a friend or a fish store when it comes to biosecurity? Ask that store representative, ask that friend of yours about the disease history um, of that tank or of that system. Um, you know, the problem is you don't know it and they might not know it either. So you have to be skeptical. Richard Ross, if you're listening or watching this, you know, thank you very much for your continued uh, skeptical reef keeping series. Uh, it reminds all of us that we, we have to constantly be skeptical about many things, but most importantly in this instance is the be skeptical about the health of the fish. You want to make sure that your systems are as healthy, healthy as possible and being skeptical uh, from a baseline is a good position to have. So, you know, by setting up a good quarantine system, uh, by having good biosecurity practices uh, in your day-to-day -day, uh, fish carrying techniques, by making sure that yourself, uh, you're not susceptible or you're reducing the susceptibility of zoonotic diseases, um, you want to make sure that your source of animals uh, is as healthy as possible. So, you know, if you know of a store near you, uh, or your friend or your local club tells you about a facility online or, or physically near you that frequently has disease problems, you know, it's up to you. Uh, and I hope you make the right choice of not uh, not shopping there or by or educating, helping educate uh, that store owner or fellow hobbyist about uh, methods that they can take to prevent the disease, uh, not only from transferring within their own system, but to their friends or to their customer systems as well. Um, there are many uh, options available to all of us now through the power of the internet uh, and through online delivery uh, to get fish and coral delivered from not only within the United States, uh, but, you know, uh, transshipped from across the world. Uh, and so you want to make sure that you are protected uh, and that you're always skeptical, skeptical of all your sources. So the best stores are typically the ones that are actually auditing their, their wholesalers. Um, I know of wholesalers in some countries that will send uh, unannounced representatives to their exporters and say, we are going to do a fish health or a system health inspection, uh, not only on your holding tanks, but on your sources as well. We want to make sure that the places that are aggregating uh, or are collecting these organisms are, are healthy and that your collectors or that your aquaculture uh, employees uh, know the biosecurity techniques and are, uh, that are practicing biosecurity techniques that will go ahead and make sure that that fish is not only healthy when at the time it's raised, but it's healthy when it goes through the marine aquarium system, uh, through the stores and into the hobbyist tank. Through the of custody, basically. Yeah. Funny, uh, there was a, uh, someone I watched on YouTube um, recently, you know, they're an um, African cichlid person, but uh, they had a pretty good saying. I think it, it applies to not only this, but a lot of places in life in general. It's uh, trust the process, not the source. Oh yeah, yeah, definitely. I think, uh, in 2008, I was made aware of a scientific paper that one of my professors, and he was an aquatic vet, uh, had on one of his slides and stuck with me. And I actually, uh, I put it at the top of the zoonotic uh, uh, article that we have on Mazin's website, and I have it right here in front of me. Uh, we can put the text up on the screen as well as we can link to this, but it says, uh, the fact that marine organisms can now be successfully collected and cultivated in aquaria also means that people no longer have to venture into the natural habitat of these creatures to be scratched, stung, bitten, or inseminated, but can now suffer these hazards in the privacy of their own home or place of work, right? So we're bringing these organisms with their disease into our homes. So be careful. Uh, that yeah. stuck with me. Go ahead. Oh, yeah, like things like, you know, for zoanthids, right? The, um, uh, yeah. The, uh, for, um, too late. Palytoxin. Yes, yeah, the palytoxin. Yeah. Right. I mean, you know, if you don't know any better, you know, your dog eats it, you cut it, you get it on yourself, you're in the world of hurt. Exactly. To that same point, around the same time, uh, one of my uh, other colleagues uh, from years past, uh, her name is Amy McKenna. Uh, thank you, Amy, for helping us with this. Uh, she wrote an article for MASNA, also available in the same place, go to MASNA.org, click on MASNA Education. Uh, you can read about the power of palytoxin. You know, this is a 
<laughs> a toxin that we have uh, plenty of in our tanks that people often don't know about. Hey, I want to uh, kill this live rock, or I want to I want to restart this tank. Let me scrub uh, and sanitize these rocks. Uh, wow. Um, yeah, so it's another article that we made sure that we had out there a couple of years ago, I think two and a half years ago now, uh, to make sure that not only hobbyists, but medical professionals are aware of this potential uh, lurking and hiding within our homes. Uh, and, you know, more so than zoonotic diseases, we see in the popular media and in the news, uh, these accounts of people slowly being poisoned by aerosolized paleotoxin in their homes. Now, whether or not the news agent or the newscaster says those words is something different, but often when I see these uh, articles po posted across various aquarium groups or forums, you know, I, I love to post that educational article. It's a great opportunity for people to uh, see the outcome of of this hazard and then to learn about it and learn how to protect themselves. Also in that article, but just like the zoonotic diseases are a summary of techniques uh, that you can go ahead and implement to make sure that yourself and that your family and even your pets, your, your mammalian pets are, uh, are safe from paleotoxin. Right. I, re I remember when I used to have zoanthids, like I had the full like face mask. And like when I went to like <laughs> and bought like the full, <laughs> Like face mask, like or like this, you know. If I ever, I, I didn't frag very many of them, but yeah. I still had that. I'm like, I'm not gonna mess with this. This is <laughs> no, it's not something you want to mess around with. And they're beautiful. And uh, to the to the enthusiasts out there, uh, we would love to have a, a palio, not a paleotoxin, but a, a zoanthid meetup at Magna because wow, they are super passionate about their zoanthid, especially their common names and naming these things. Um, but uh, yeah, there are people who have entire tanks of zoanthids. And uh, I hope that those people who are taking care of those uh, zoanthid tanks understand what they have in their tank and know how to clean it. Uh, it's a bit of Darwinism because I think that they wouldn't have continued on with the passion of keeping zoanthids had they have been infected by or uh, affected by uh, the, the paleotoxin, but you never know. So Mike, thank you very much for having me. And if people wanna learn more about uh, biosecurity, um, and marine aquariums, they can contact me, uh, whether it's through my Mazda email or through my personal email. Uh, you can find me at uh, kevin.erickson at mazda.org uh, if you want to talk to me about uh, all things marine aquarium. Um, you can just go ahead and Google uh, marine aquarium biosecurity. Uh, often myself uh, and some of my mentors will come up uh, as people uh, to communicate with, uh, with that topic. Um, and definitely make sure that you're implementing uh, all the techniques that we discussed here today. And if you want access to those educational articles uh, for paleotoxin or for zoonotic diseases, uh, go to masna.org and click on uh, Masna Education. Uh, there's a lot of good reading there. And once again, those are available both as a web page uh, and as a, as a PD PDF printable uh, article. So thank you very much, Mike. Uh, great show. And I, I, I hope that uh, not only the subscribers you have now, but also uh, people across the internet can uh, learn from uh, the, our biosecurity discussion today. Absolutely. Uh, thank you, Kevin. You gave me a lot to think about too. I mean, I do, you know, I do, you know, we all do our best to do the best for our animals and ourselves, but obviously there's always more we can do. So I do appreciate you coming on, Kevin. Uh, like we discussed previously in this video, um, all the links to the articles and Kevin's contact information will be in the description. Uh, if this is your first time watching, uh, please check out the video that will come at the end of this video in the end screen. Like the channel, please like, subscribe, smash the notification bell. And as always, stay fishy, keep on breeding, and uh, we'll talk to you guys later. Mike, and stay fishy, everyone.